what's driving me in particular as an artist towards NFTs is like what Karen mentioned was that it's community driven and nobody owns it. So there's full autonomy over what you choose to invest in, what you choose to create, the communities that you surround yourself by and the projects that pique your interest. Welcome to the Conscious Economics Podcast. I'm your host, Rhiannon Roseland. I'm a serial entrepreneur and social innovator. I like to gather people from all different walks to talk about what I call the conscious economy. I believe that we can create a more equitable system, one that honors the well being of people, the well being of the planet, the well being of business, and includes art and creativity. Join us each week as we tackle a different intersection of this big but critical conversation. What's up, everyone, and welcome back to the Conscious Economics Podcast. I'm your host, Rhiannon Roseland. Today, we are here live at the Moon Manor, but we've got a bit of a different setup because we've got a really special guest in the house with us today. Well, two really special guests, actually. Um, so starting off, a face that you all know, Laura Carbon Bornicelli, obviously are part of our crew at Conscious Economics, but also an artist herself and co-founder of Queer Collective. Um, so thank you so much, Laura, for being back on this side of the camera with us as we talk about what is very, very cool. So we needed to bring Karen in as an expert. Karen Dang, she's the Director of Innovation and Ecosystem at Interact. And so thank you so much, Karen, for being here with us today. We needed to have an expert in because this topic in this conversation is blowing up and there's so much to learn. So we are going to be talking today around the artist experience in using non-fungible tokens, NFTs, and really start to understand and break down what this new economy technology is all about, this new currency. It's an exciting thing. I know so little, um, so that is why you were both here. So to start off, Karen, can you tell us a little bit about what is an NFT to start with and what makes it valuable? Yeah, I think um, something to predicate all this conversation is I'm not an expert per se. I don't think there are any true experts, just given how this topic has exploded in the past two years. The original NFTs, CryptoKitties and, and the like were from the 90s. Like, it's so it's such a novel and interesting idea. And I think sort of driven by COVID and sort of our, our need to be a part of a community and our need to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. So. That's my little side note that to start with. So an NFT really is a place on the digital ledger, on the blockchain, generally Ethereum. And what that means is that it can't be replicated, it can be traded, bought, fragmented, um, but it can represent and it can be pegged to an experience, an art piece, a ticket, a piece of music, um, even like things like slam dunks, um, which they've certainly done. So it's a way, I think, for artists to engage in sort of like digital value exchange and kind of take back their power. And I think similar to physical or analog art, the value really lies in a few things. And the first is the market. So what is the market for that? What are people really interested in? Um, what are they willing to buy? and invest in. Uh, the second is the artist itself. So, you know, it, imagine buying a Picasso before Picasso's death. We, a lot of people know that his, his kind of pre prevalence and prominence on the art market really came out after his passing and not during. So in that way, it's very, very similar as a collectible. And then finally, I think there's a part of like an emotional, sentimental part to it. So owning a moment in time or a moment in space. And then of course, I, I, I've referred to this early on, but I think the biggest part for me is the community that surrounds it. So being a part of a collective, understanding sort of where that falls in whatever community you belong to, either you know the art community or the basketball community and so on. So in that way, NFTs, I think, can, can create a lot of value and they can drive a lot of value. So Karen, I love that explanation. And for those of us that may be at different levels at home listening, could you briefly describe to us what is the blockchain? Because I think that that is you know, a really good place to start in just understanding where and how NFTs exist. That's a great question, Rianne. And, and I think being able to kind of take it back to basics, the blockchain is really a digital form of a ledger book. So we're able to create records and track those records no matter who they move to, where they move, and no one can take that away from any single person. So it's not owned by anyone. It's not like you know going to um, a centralized place where you have to record, but it's actually owned by a whole community of people. So that's how I would describe the blockchain in 
a minute. No, that's so helpful. Thank you so much for describing that. I remember when I was a kid going to the bank and having my little bank book and like, you know, when you'd make a transaction, you'd have it written down in your bank book and you'd be able to see that. But now this is like a global bank book where everyone can see all of these transactions, which is so cool. Um, and it means so much in so many different ways, which we can get into. But Laura, I wanted to turn to you. So obviously our community knows you as an artist, full-time artist, and someone who's advocating on behalf of artists, um, especially from the queer community. What's driving your interest right now in NFTs and this full yeah, movement? I think that what's driving me in particular as an artist towards NFTs is like what Karen mentioned was that it's community driven and nobody owns it. So there's full autonomy over what you choose to invest in, what you choose to create, the communities that you surround yourself by, and the projects that pique your interest. Like everything is made by people that are just like us. So it's very relatable in that sense. When I look at a project and I see that I can speak to the, the founders of it, I can speak to the owners, I can speak to the artists one-on-one, -on -one, that's powerful because then I'm getting information from them, I'm getting inspiration from them. We're all sharing what we know with each other and we're building a stronger community that can then succeed long term in a place like this where I'm sure there will be a lot of corporations and bigger players that will want to get into it that will want to sort of oversaturate the market. Uh, it's good to be in there early now and it's exciting because it feels like we're going to have a backbone to the community dri driven projects. Mm, that's really interesting and an interesting angle to look at it. I wanted to ask you Karen and this is obviously another question of mine what is the connection between NFTs and cryptocurrency? If cryptocurrency is the new money and the metaverse is the new reality, then the NFTs are the new good. And that's how you can kind of think about it in the scheme of value exchange. So if we're all moving to, you know, VR headsets and things like that, um, imagine being able to show off your gallery, your NFT gallery, um, and you, you own these things, but how do you prove that in a virtual space? Mm -hmm. We can walk into this beautiful building, see these pictures and be like, well, this is a part of conscious economics. NFTs are just the virtual form of that and you would buy that with cryptocurrency. So you cannot purchase an NFT without using a cryptocurrency for that purchase? At this point, no. There are definitely a lot of fintechs that are making it easier. Like you can use your credit card to purchase cryptocurrencies to purchase your NFT, um, really making that process more streamlined. But at this point, I, I do believe most uh, NFT exchanges require some form of cryptocurrency yeah. or another. Yeah, that's so interesting. And again, like thinking about if we were in a video game and there was a currency within that video game, like Mario coins, <laughs> then obviously if I was in Super Mario Brothers, I wouldn't be able to you know, use my money in my wallet. I'd have to have those Mario coins inside the game. So this really is this new virtual economy, um, virtual marketplace, and this is how this all functions, which is so, so interesting. So one of the things that you said, which definitely caught my eye, and I think this is why there is a generation that's really interested in the blockchain, in cryptocurrencies, in NFTs, and it's about this decentralization, this idea that we can actually, as community, come to this marketplace and that there isn't these you know, structures or institutions but it's actually more for the people by the people. And I think that that's a lot of what you're saying. Um, I know for you, Laura, you're definitely somebody who is always advocating on behalf of artists and wanting to maintain those community values within the art world. So I guess my question would be, what do you think are the biggest opportunities within this space, but also what are the threats? I think the opportunities, first of all, far outweigh the, the cons of the NFT market. There's so many opportunities there, especially as an artist. Like, there's opportunities when it comes to being the artist for the project. So if you're a graphic designer, if you're a painter, if you're somebody that sketches, uh, you can create the art for these projects. And that will take you far depending on, you know, if you pick a good project to do the art for. There's also opportunities in music. NFTs can be used for music. NFTs can be used uh, for video. They can be used for so many different things. So as an artist, it's very exciting to 
kind of be at the forefront of what is driving these projects because something that I have noticed that is common amongst almost every single project that comes out is that the art is the first thing that everybody looks at. So the art is what's driving the interest for people to even look at like, okay, well, what's the roadmap? I like your art, now I wanna see your roadmap. So it's the art first, and that's extremely exciting because uh, traditionally when it comes to companies, when it comes to having a business, you don't normally drive your business with art first. Mm -hmm. You drive it with your business plan. Yes. So it's very exciting that it's the reverse in this scenario. Mm -hmm. Now when it comes to the cons, there are definitely a couple of things to worry about. One of the things that I worry about as an artist is potentially getting involved in the wrong project. Mm -hmm. If you're working with a team that is, for example, anonymous, or maybe they're doxxed, but in reality, like their Instagram was made like a week ago, or their Twitter, you know, was you know was made this year, there's not really that history. Um, it means that if you're attached to that project and that project goes south or ends up building a, a bad reputation, that can have a negative effect on you as the artist. Another con that I do see potentially is the bigger projects uh, that have more funding behind it initially. Uh, so I'm talking like corporations, I'm talking larger commercial projects. Uh, what has happened a few times in the past is that sometimes these bigger projects with these bigger names end up getting majority of the market share mm -hmm. and it kind of dries out the market for the rest of the smaller projects that are really trying to be community driven. But I feel sure. like that issue translates to the regular economy all the time as well. Like, you know, we understand that as Conscious Economics, we're a small not-for-profit community driven organization and sometimes we're competing, you know, in a space where someone comes in with like, you know, the big guns in terms of like just having massive funding or something and can just like wash out what you were trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that exists there as well. Um, but that's so interesting to kind of hear your perspective on those pieces. And we obviously are on the forefront of looking at all of the trends that are impacting the economy. And right now, if we look at this sort of social sentiment, political sentiment, corporate sentiment, everything right now is around sustainability, ESG, equity, inclusion, diversity. So when we look through that lens, that mindful lens at the economy, how do NFTs support building this more conscious economy? And what are some of the things we need to think about when we're trying to adopt and build the digital economy from that lens? I think one of the biggest opportunities, I think Lois kind of pointed out, is you know where does the role of the big players fall in this? And I think the fact that we're able to kind of build this from scratch, we don't need to necessarily take on sort of the institutional gatekeepers uh, of traditions past. So if you think about you know uh, auction houses, for example, what would it take for an artist to even get in. Mm -hmm. Like it's so fraught with barriers and institutional racism and sexism and, and all the horrible things that colonization, decolonization, I could go on. So I think it's an opportunity for us to really take a hard look at that and just like at a foundational level, build in inclusion by design. I mean, like in what I do um, with my group is like, how do we not wash others out? How do we actually be meaningful partners as corporations rather than, you know, just slapping our name on something and saying, well, this is ours now. So definitely a lot of thought goes into that as a team. Coming back to your question is like, what can we do as regulatory deals with this, as ecosystems deal with this, as, as companies, individuals? I think the benefit here is we have the opportunity to lower barrier to entry, mm -hmm. but only if we try, only if we really think about it, only if we engage creators, collectors, exchanges right from the get-go right. and understand how can we all I, th I believe that there can be an all-win situation but I don't think that comes without mindfulness yeah. um, and then I think like coming back to the creators to Laura's point which is why I love that this is a three-way conversation of you know what does the collector really want from this mm -hmm. like I I believe that a lot of artists they're not just in it for financial gain but also like so their legacy lives on yeah. and I think that's what's so beautiful about NFTs being on the blockchain is it lives in perpetuity. It's forever. Hold that thought. We have a quick word from our partners before going back to the episode. 
This podcast is brought to you by our sponsor, RBC Investees. Backed by expert human advisors, RBC Investees is a smart, online, automated investment service that allows you to invest with low effort and low cost. Open your first RBC Investees account and pay no management fees for your first year. Plus, start investing with as little as $100. Simply visit rbcinvestees.com slash getinvesting and sign up using promo code AA407. And now back to the episode. So Laura, if you were to really um, think about this deeply, do you see NFTs as a source of, of goodness for the art world, for art? Like, is it a force for good? Is it, yeah. is it something that we should be excited about? Yeah, well, I think like with anything, with any new, uh, idea, there are opportunities for it to be bad and there are opportunities for it to be really, really great. Even what Karen was mentioning is that uh, the bigger players, like how do they go about it in a way without washing out everybody else and you know, having it start with intention? That's what matters here and that's what the precedent needs to be when creating this new world in the metaverse, in the NFT space. Um, and I do think that it is a bigger source of opportunity and good than it is uh, a source for exploitation or scams mm-hmm. or any of mm-hmm. that negative. I think about it in so many layers because again, we know that when we look through a lens of inclusion and diversity and colonization, there's so many different aspects um, to those conversations in terms of, you know, it's the difference between equality and equity really in terms of how we approach it for different groups. And so again, thinking about this, there's so much opportunity right now. You can feel it buzzing like everyone's talking about it people are so interested and curious but there are these layers so like what if I'm someone who doesn't have easy access still to um, to the internet and to um, to Wi-Fi technology which is why I think we're talking about that as a basic fundamental human right now because we can't participate in the digital economy if we don't have that access or you know for even someone like myself um, I've always been a little bit Um, apprehensive around adaptation to new technology. I'm definitely not the first in line. I'm like maybe, you know, a couple months back in terms of being able to be comfortable to adapt to new things. So I think that right now with all of this buzz, there's all these players that are like, oh, there's an opportunity here racing to the market. What about those that are entering at the midway point or later? Will it be all dried up? Will will all the real estate be taken, so to speak, virtually? Um, and, And those are all not necessarily questions that we answer here right now but these are the kinds of things I think organizations have to really be mindful about and having these dialogues around the potentials and the what if so that we even know what we're planning for Um, and the number one way I think that we do that is through consultation with community is through speaking to the very people that we want to serve and want to be served by the technology and I think that's always first and foremost um, really important. Well to your point I think that actually is the most exciting thing is that when it comes to NFTs and getting in these communities it's at such an infancy like there's a long, long, long way to go to get to, for example, where the internet internet is right now, right? Like back in the day, at its infancy, majority of people didn't even see the value in it. Um, so the exciting thing is that NFTs right now, for the majority, are being built by these small communities. So when the big players come in, there's already these existing small communities that can give advice, can say, hey, this is the way that we're doing it. No, we're not doing it this way that's very exploitative or or whatever the case. We're doing it this way. And this is how the community reacts well. The way that you were doing things before isn't going to work in this space. Mm -hmm. So there is a restructure that that has to happen for uh, bigger players that want to come into the space. They really do have to think about, okay, what is the community saying? What do they want? And how can I approach it in that way? And then you see platforms like OpenSea where, you know, you, anyone can mint anything. Of course, it comes back again into your question of like, what's the value? But, you know, when Picasso was doing doodles, people were like, well, that's a nice napkin. Um, but the value now, it, it's, it's manifested many, many, many years later. So I think, Laura, to your point, it's completely about bringing the power back to the people um, and then bringing along the organizations that really do 
well, I mean, at least myself and my team, like we really do care. We wonder, you know, how do we make this next generation of value exchange better than the previous one? Yeah. How do we enhance it? How do we take really great learnings, but then also add? How do we make more out of what's there? The other thing that came up that you described, so you talked about creating the initial art for the NFT, but then the roadmap, which is almost like the business plan that goes with that potential piece of art. And you said that sometimes there could be a project where initially people come in and invest, but then that roadmap still has to be executed. So that's another area I feel where there's this bit of uncertainty, um, obviously, that's the same in the the real physical world. Like I could go to Intrac and say, I'm going to do this project and we come in together and then I don't fulfill the project. Um, and, you know, that would then I'd get a reputation for myself and that would quickly be discovered. So I think that's the same thing here. But could we talk a little bit about that? So one of the pros and at the same time, it's a con uh, of Web3 is that you can be anyone and you can start everybody starts at like the same base level. It creates like this pool of like, I don't know, there's more equality in the, in the space. Um, but the problem with being able to be anyone is that you can also be anonymous. And if you're anonymous, then how do you, how can I trust that you're actually gonna fulfill what you say that you're gonna fulfill? Um, so this is actually where we need to bring in more technology that allows uh, people to be authenticated and we know exactly who's building the project. Uh, this, there is a place for anonymous projects, but it's largely being sort of washed out. Like people want to know who they're working with. Right. And when it comes to fulfilling the roadmap, well, essentially your reputation is on the line if you don't fulfill the roadmap. Right. And I know there's hundreds, thousands of projects that currently exist that will never fulfill their roadmap. Mm -hmm. And that's the trial and error that we have to go through to build a better system. Yeah, thank you for that. That's so interesting. The other question, just to kind of come back to, to the conversation um, around building an equitable you know, marketplace within this digital economy. One of the things that I equated to is this idea of market sentiment. So like market sentiment drives share value in the regular economy, in the regular stock market all the time. Meaning if we all decide that we don't like what a company stands for, or what they're doing, we as consumers, you know, make that choice clear with our purchasing power, everything else, and that can drive share value and market value and it can actually force an organization to change its ways. And so again, when we think about the digital economy and this new frontier really, I think so many of us have been imagining how do we create a new system that is more collaborative, that is more um, equitable. But we have this opportunity right now. This is a brand new Wild West like we get to create. And I think being able to understand that even for those that are watching that feel so removed from this conversation, now's the time to be at the table even if you are feeling removed because that's who we should be listening to. Like everybody has an equal voice in this right now as it's being created, which is so cool and it, which is why Conscious Economics wants to drive these conversations. And whenever I think about working with Interact, one of the things that I love about you guys is that community consultation approach that you always take to everything. I remember sitting down with one of your executives and hearing about how you had young people at your boardroom table, um, you know, and that to me was so progressive. And this is, you know, the way that the values that you instill at Intrac are being driven into conversations like this. So is that kind of the role that you're taking right now at Intrac of just trying to really bring folks together around these conversations? I mean, I think, I think that's a part of it. I think it's a part of really understanding what creators, collectors, the community more broadly needs. Um, I think we, and I guess this is a call to action for everyone in the industry is like, we, this system is being created. No one is an expert, I would argue. No one knows everything. So it's such an opportunity to kind of paint this picture as we go to create that. And I would say for anyone out there who's like not sure or wants to play in the space, try, just try to create, try to do something different. And I think every little bit of input will make this system better. It's how you mentioned that if you're invested in a company, for example, and you own shares and 
we don't like how a company is running something, we can choose to give our opinion to the company and have them sort of change the way that they're going about that particular thing. In my opinion, current in its current state, it's even easier to do that with NFTs mm -hmm. because there's even less shares mm -hmm. of this company that you're investing into. Right. So say, for example, you have a collection of 5,000, only 5,000. And usually people hold more, more than one at a time. Mm -hmm. So if you only have like 5,000 votes versus millions of votes, yeah. it's much easier to change the direction in which that project is going or change the way that decisions are being made. Mm -hmm. It actually gives you more autonomy and more control yeah. over what is happening and what you want to see happen. Yeah. I also think a part of this, and not to be the commercial person here, is like you own, because you can track it over time, you own it in perpetuity, or you, you are the creator in perpetuity. Right. So conventionally, um, like a painting or a photograph, the artist gets their payday the first time it's sold. And then on the secondary market, when it's traded, it's sold, they firstly might not even know that happened right. and they get no royalties from it. But yeah. the fact that it's on the ledger, you can see, you can track and you can build in that financial power right from the beginning when right. you mint your NFT. And you can see what the royalties are as exactly. well. Exactly. Right there, when you buy an NFT, it says this is the cost and we're also charging 5% royalties. You now have access to every single thing that is happening with your art. And that gives you more That's power. That's so cool. Yeah. Well, and the certainty around being able to always be paid, no matter where this piece goes, no matter what happens, because it's on the blockchain, because no one can erase it or delete it, and every single transaction is accounted for, you're never going to be screwed out of a deal, I guess, is the, is the best way to say it. But this is just such a shift in terms of the power that artists now will hold. And again, I've never before seen so much conversation, both by governments, corporations, individual society around art. My, my last question that I want to say before we wrap it up is really around climate change and sustainability. So we know that that is so important. It's everything right now. We have to figure this out as a humanity uh, that we, we need to be able to reverse the damage that we're doing and not be creating more damage. And we know that right now um, being able to you know mine on the blockchain and all of these things takes an incredible amount of energy. Um, and so what is what does that conversation look like around creating more sustainable ways to have this digital economy run and thrive? You can say that NFTs, cryptocurrency, metaverse, that entire space uh, takes up energy. And it does. And it absolutely does. And um, it, it does have an impact on the environment. Um, does that mean that we just shouldn't do it? I don't think so. Uh, because if we think about just to use cars as an example, oil and gas, you know, that's what we use to drive our cars throughout history. Um, does that mean that we should just stop driving cars or are we innovating towards electric vehicles, for example? Uh, that's how I think, in my opinion, we should think about it. It's not necessarily, okay, let's stop everything then. Yeah. Rather, we have to think about it. Yeah, you're right. It does consume energy. How can we be more mindful than the previous industries exactly. and set an example? Exactly. How can we reduce our energy consumption? How can we reduce the impact on the environment? Yeah. And because there is a large conversation around that, that is what's happening. Like people are coming up with solutions. Exactly. Like we see solutions, whether it be like on different cryptocurrencies, uh, like for example, Ethereum does take a lot of uh, energy, yeah. but people are coming up with other cryptocurrencies that are more efficient. Yeah. And on top of that, people are coming up with layer two solutions that work on the Ethereum blockchain, but are also more efficient and take up less energy and have uh, faster transactions. Yeah. That um, interest and that demand from the creator, from the consumer is what drives the solution. Because if yeah. we don't ask for it or want it or consciously think about it, then we don't come up with these new innovations and technologies. But the more that we drive that and have that as part of our consultation, our, our questions, the more we're gonna see something else 
come out. And it's always interesting because I think especially of us that have spent a lot of time in the inclusion space or the social justice space, we think a lot about all of these things and these layers of uh, challenges um, and how deep they go. And we always dream about these systems and societies where we can function in a different way. But what's interesting is sometimes without even realizing it, when something is created, we adapt the old things and we adopt the old things without even realizing it because they're so entrenched, we don't realize we can ask another question or we could try another way. And that's what I want to really focus on as we close out this conversation today, that we are the drivers of this new space. We are the creators. If we want to be able to see something that is going to serve artists, serve community, be a marketplace where the big players can work, with the smaller uh, community players in an equitable and amazing way that can drive value for everybody, then we have to believe that's possible and step into the arena with that in mind, which I think is why these conversations are so important today. And I thank you both so much for coming. Last to kind of sign off, Karen, can you tell anyone who's watching, where can they find out more about NFTs? How could someone figure out how to maybe start a project or create one? Could you, could you lead us? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And I think coming back to the earliest part of our conversations, there are no real experts in this space. So there's a lot of resources. They're very easy to look up. Um, I think the, the fact that there's so many different channels and so many different choices for artists, I think that's an absolute positive that people should take advantage of right now. Um, at Interact, you know, we're always looking to work with our community partners like Conscious Economics, obviously, and others um, to kind of be able to close that digital divide when it comes to NFTs, conversations like this, and, and how do we build as a community tools to help empower artists, creators, uh, collectors, collaborators even, um, in creating sort of like low risk or no risk environments where people can test things out, similar to a sandbox. So I would say follow Interact. Um, we're doing some fun stuff. Follow Conscious Economics because we're doing fun stuff together. <laughs> Absolutely. And Laura, any last piece of advice for artists or anyone that's listening to this right now? Yeah, I also highly encourage that. Like get into, look up projects, look up projects that pique your interest, get into their Twitters, get into their Discord communities, just start asking questions. You don't have to buy anything right now. You can just ask questions and chat with people, learn more, and then start to make more informed decisions. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you to both of you. This has been so informative for me, I know. Um, and for those of you at home, uh, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you again next week on the Conscious Economics Podcast. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by CPP Investments. At CPP Investments, they never lose sight of the long term. They invest the Canadian Pension Plan Fund to help provide financial security for generations of Canadians. They diversify the CPP fund across geographies and asset classes to access the best investment opportunities and generate sustainable long-term returns. The fund is now more than $400 billion. To learn more about their investment performance for Canadians, visit cppinvestments.com.